In 1775, most American colonists were in a rage. They were tired of British taxation and domination, and they were ready to start a war. They created armed resistance to British troops at the battles of Lexington and Concord and the Battle of Bunker Hill. And they were so successful, that made them bold enough, they decided to put it in writing and go for freedom. In July 1776, 52 men signed their names to America's Declaration of Independence. They pledged their lives and their fortunes in that glorious cause. But in spite of their fervor for freedom, the signers soon found out it was easier said than won. By the time the Continental Congress gathered to vote on the Declaration of Independence, the largest British force ever assembled on the North American continent was debarking in New York with a pledge from British King George III to pound the colonies into submission. In no time at all, the fledgling Patriot Army under General George Washington were forced to retreat from New York into New Jersey, prompting Washington to later conclude, the game is pretty near up. And in spite of stunning victories in New Jersey and Saratoga, which brought France into the war as an American ally, Washington's army was not able to prevent the British from occupying the American capital of Philadelphia. And as the war raged on, Washington's troops starved and suffered during the harsh winters at Valley Forge and Morristown. The revolution was on the verge of collapse, prompting Washington to write Congress and say, The situation with the army is beyond description. Our magazines are absolutely empty everywhere and our commissaries entirely destitute of money or credit to replenish them. There is every appearance that the army will disband in a fortnight. A week later, the day before Christmas, 1779, Washington ordered corn meant for the horses ground up and given to the men. In January 1780, two Massachusetts regiments which had not been paid in a year or eaten in four days, though half of them were shoeless, planned to walk home since they'd already eaten their horses. With Washington's army melting away, the British colonial secretary George Germain sensed victory, and he remarked, So very contemptible is the rebel force now that no resistance is to be apprehended that can materially obstruct the speedy suppression of the rebellion. French General Rochambeau, whose French army languished at the abandoned British base at Newport, Rhode Island, wrote to his government and said, send us troops, ships, and money, but do not count on these people nor their resources. They have neither money nor credit. With a stalemate in the north, pressure mounted for a British victory in the southern colonies. It began with great success. The British captured Georgia in 1779. Then, in 1780, they forced the surrender of an entire American army of 5,000 at Charleston, South Carolina, the South's largest city and most important port. After the devastating defeat of a second American army at Camden, South Carolina, a few months later, British commander Lord Cornwallis exclaimed, I have the pleasure to inform you that on the morning of the 16th, I attacked and totally defeated General Gates's army. Above a thousand were killed and wounded and about 800 taken prisoners. We are in possession of eight pieces of brass cannon, all they had in the field, all their ammunition, wagons, and a great number of arms, and 130 baggage wagons. In short, there never was a more complete victory. I have given orders that all the inhabitants of this province who have taken part in this revolt should be punished with the greatest rigor, that they should be imprisoned and their whole property taken from them or destroyed. I have ordered in the most positive manner that every militia man who had borne arms with us and had afterwards joined the enemy should be immediately hanged. The British, it seemed, now had an open road all the way to Virginia, the most powerful colony. Then, tragedy struck again. One of America's most admired generals, Benedict Arnold, attempted to give the British one of the most strategic locations in the North at West Point. But just as the War for Independence was turning to ashes, a new hero emerged. Congress and American General Nathaniel Greene to raise a third American army in the South. However, George Washington knew the stakes were high, and he offered little chance for Greene's success. He wrote to Congress. In the command he's going into, he will have every disadvantage to struggle with. 
Before he took command of the Southern Army, Greene pleaded with Congress and with the governors of the states he passed through to give aid to the remnant of the Southern Army near Charlotte. But no help came. Greene was on his own now. When General Greene arrived at Charlotte, North Carolina in December of 1780 to take command of the Southern Army that remained after Camden, supplies and wagons were few. Many of the men were shoeless, and a great number were hungry and sick. He later wrote, When I came to this army, I found it in the most wretched condition, totally unfit for any type of service, the shadow of an army in the midst of distress. With January 1781 just weeks away, that year would prove to be the most crucial year of the revolution. While Greene was preparing to challenge Cornwallis in the South, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey troops in Washington's army mutinied. George Washington was fighting his own men, and he despaired to John Lawrence, America's envoy to France, that the patience of the Northern Army is nearly exhausted, and the people are discontented from relentless taxation and the war. With feeble confidence in Washington, because his army had been idle for two years, French Foreign Minister Vergennes concluded that the war couldn't continue beyond 1781. So the French were looking for a way out. They entertained peace initiatives with other European powers to conclude the American War. Even British General Henry Clinton, the Commander-in-Chief of all British forces in America, wrote later in his history of the war, the rebellion in America was in its last gasp, for it was well known at the time that the French would not assist the Americans beyond the campaign of 81. As the American Revolution teetered on the verge of collapse, Nathaniel Greene's challenge was just beginning. Greene, an iron foundry worker from Rhode Island, had only studied books on war strategy before he served under George Washington. Now, he faced perhaps the best British general in North America, Lord Cornwallis, a member of the British Parliament and a career military officer who commanded a larger force of veteran British troops. This time, Washington had a say in picking his man, although truth be told, even Congress by this point had recognized that Nathaniel Greene was the right commander for this job. In terms of professional military experience and learning, Greene was far and away junior to Lord Cornwallis in stature. Yet Cornwallis had fought against Greene in the Northern campaigns, and he acknowledged that Greene is as dangerous as Washington. He is vigilant, enterprising, and full of resources. But with little hope of gaining an advantage over him, I never feel secure when encamped in his neighborhood. Confronted with Greene once again, Cornwallis might have wondered if Greene was still dangerous. He was about to find out. Even before Greene took command of the ravaged American army at Charlotte, the southern colonies had been embroiled in a civil war between patriot and loyalist forces, with partisan military harassing the British army, preventing them from maintaining tight control over captured territory. The British had gone into the southern colonies assuming that it was going to be a bastion of loyalist sentiment, and when they found that the loyalties of the people were far more divided, they moved out into the countryside, which rallied the support of loyalists and Tory militiamen, who then waged their own sort of bitter war against patriot militia families. And this threw the back country into absolute turmoil, but it did little to stabilize the Crown's control on its North American colonies. In fact, by October 1780, Cornwallis's advance toward Virginia had been hampered by a severe defeat at Kings Mountain between patriot and loyalist militia. Taking advantage of Cornwallis' setback, Greene divided his army. He sent his weak and sick eastward to Chiraw, South Carolina, and a light force under General Daniel Morgan, a veteran of the French and Indian War, westward to threaten British military outposts. In the southern colonies, Green didn't have that kind of manpower at his disposal. He knew he was not going to be able to inflict such a massive blow, so he violated military conventions of the day by dividing his forces in front of superior numbers. What this did was it made it easier for him to resupply his army, but it also kept Cornwallis's army off balance. Now in terms of why Green was able to do this, where he got the skill or the wisdom to be able to wage such a war when he was such a novice, we can only speculate. Washington, however, seems to have been a very astute judge of military talent, and it didn't take long from the time that they first met in early July of 1775 before Green had risen in Washington's estimation to become one of his most trusted advisors and subordinate generals. 
Cornwallis played into Greene's brilliant strategy by dividing his forces as well. When he divided his army at Charlotte and sent Morgan west, and he took his men east to Chiraw on the, on the Yadkin PD River, uh, what you have is you have a situation where the British can't go both ways and expect to win. Cornwallis sent the cream of his army, commanded by Colonel Bannister Bloody Tarleton, a brutally aggressive young officer, to deal with Morgan. In January 1781 at the Battle of Calpins, Morgan lured his British opponent into a trap. It devastated Tarleton's detachment. 90% of them were killed, wounded, or captured. The victory was a major turning point in the Southern Campaign. Morgan, with 500 British prisoners, headed northward to distance himself from Cornwallis's retaliation that was sure to come. Cornwallis described this humiliating defeat as a very unexpected and severe blow, and he wrote to Colonial Secretary Lord Germain and said, This late affair has almost broke my heart. A few days later, he paused at Ramsers Mill, North Carolina, and burned all his excess baggage, extra provisions for his soldiers, and all but a few wagons. If I'd been a British private in the 33rd or the 23rd, or even in the guards, and I saw the officer's stuff being burned, and mind you, the guards at this stage did not have tents. They had left their tents behind because they couldn't get them through the swamps in South Carolina when they went to join uh, Cornwallis's force at Winsboro. So they haven't got any tents anyway. And so when they see the rum going on the ground, pouring it out, I would have said, boy, this does not look good. With his army now traveling light and able to move fast, Cornwallis hoped to cut off General Morgan's retreat northward. British General O'Hara wrote that Without baggage, necessaries or provisions of any sort for officer or soldier in the most barren, inhospitable, unhealthy part of North America, opposed to the most savage, inveterate, perfidious, cruel enemy, with zeal and with bayonets only, it was resolved to follow Green's army to the end of the world. Morgan's men and his prisoners continued north ahead of Cornwallis, crossing the Catawba and then the Yadkin Rivers as they marched through North Carolina. Undeterred, Cornwallis kept coming in his relentless quest to annihilate the American army. On February 9th, at Guilford Courthouse, now present-day Greensboro, Morgan's men reunited with the main American army from Chiraw and Colonel Lighthorse Harry Lee's legion. With the British so close, Nathaniel Green was faced with a crucial decision. Continued retreat into Virginia would abandon North Carolina and leave the rest of the South to be occupied by the British. But Green's army was now nearly exhausted. Morgan's men had marched 130 miles in freezing cold, crossing flooded rivers and mud-soaked roads. Colonel Benjamin Ford described the main army's trek from Sorrell when he said, from Petey to Guilford, the army might have been tracked by the blood from the feet of the men who were all barefooted. Worse yet, Green's dispatch to Congress also noted that, This army does not consist of more than 1,426 infantry regulars, many of whom are badly armed and distressed for want of clothing. There is a militia consisting of 600 men, but badly armed. To all these circumstances is added that of the armies being now without provisions and no magazines of any sort within our reach. Green's anxiety mounted. I expect Cornwallis to be at this place by tomorrow noon at the farthest, nor do I know whether it will be in our power to avoid any action. The enemy moves with such rapidity. Cornwallis's army, only 25 miles away at present-day Winston-Salem, North Carolina, both armies were equal distance from the shallow upper fords of the Dan River. Cornwallis was now in a position to cut off Green's army before he reached the river and escaped. The next day, February 10, 1781, Green wrote a do-or-die dispatch to Patrick Henry. My force is too inconsiderable to mark the limits of the enemy's deprivations or in any wise to check the rapidity of their march through this unhappy country. I must repeat it, the present moment is big with the most important consequences and requires the greatest and most spirited exertions. Green divided his army once again, sending a fast-moving light force northwest toward the upper reaches of the Dan River to mislead Cornwallis, while Green's main army actually headed northeast 
toward the lower fords near the present-day South Boston, Virginia, in Halifax County, 80 miles away. Cornwallis believed that flooding from the constant rain and the lack of boats would prevent Green from crossing downstream. By February 12th, Cornwallis had discovered the fake, but it worked long enough for Green's main force to get ahead of Cornwallis. On the journey from Guilford Courthouse, Green's army struggled through winter rain, freezing mud and snow, with worn out shoes, tattered clothes, few blankets, and little food or sleep. Both armies marched day and night, so close at times that frequent skirmishes occurred between them. It was a retreat that captured the attention of the nation. Light Horse Harry Lee wrote that no operation during the war attracted more public attention than did this. The safety of the South excited universal concern and alarmed the hearts of all. By 7 p.m. on Tuesday, February 13th, Colonel Otho Holland Williams, Green's Light Force Commander, sent a dispatch to Green indicating the enemy was moving rapidly. He said, rely on it, my dear sir. It's possible for you to be overtaken before you can cross the dam. Later that night, Holland's Light Force encountered campfires ahead of them. Green continued that night toward the Dan River, and by 4 a.m. the next morning, February 14th, he wrote to Williams, Follow our route. I have not slept four hours since you left me, so great has been my solicitude to prepare for the worst. By that afternoon, Green's main army had reached the river, and he wrote Williams, all our troops are over and the stage is clear. I'm ready to receive you and give you a hearty welcome. But the British troops arrived too late. When the British troops finally arrived at the river, Green's entire army was not only safe in Halifax County, Virginia, but had all the available boats on their side. The British were unable to cross the river and they retreated back into North Carolina a few days later. The day after he crossed the Dan, an exhausted Green wrote Washington. The miserable situation of our troops for want of clothing had rendered the march the most painful imaginable. Several hundreds of the soldiers tracking the ground with their bloody feet. Our army are in good spirits, notwithstanding their suffering and excessive fatigue. With food now in abundance, and militia pouring in from surrounding counties, Green prepared to mount an offense against British Commander Cornwallis. On February 17th, Green's hopes now renewed, he wrote from Halifax Courthouse. I have some expectation of collecting a force sufficient in this country to enable me to act offensively and in turn race Cornwallis as he has done me. General Nathaniel Green's army had survived they would live to fight another day. And by successfully retreating to the Dan River and getting safely across it, Green was able to preserve that precious combat power while at the same time stretching Cornwallis's army to its absolute limits. It was certainly a turning point in the Southern Theater of Operations because afterward, the strength and morale of Green's army rose while the strength and morale of Cornwallis's army dropped. Consequently, Cornwallis had to fall back on his own lines of communication, and by the time Green decided to recross the Dan River, he had a lot more men who were a lot more confident of their own abilities. They went on to fight a very important battle at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. In its own way, the Dan crossing of Green is just as important as Washington castling the Delaware because Green did retain the initiative and what he does when he retains that initiative is he has now broken the back of Cornwallis's army in the sense that logistically it can no longer support itself and it's on a slow road to ruin if they don't do something to about supplying themselves. After recrossing the Dan, that day came. Green met Cornwallis at Guilford Courthouse on March 15th. The reinforced Americans now enjoyed a larger force than Cornwallis and engaged the British forces in one of the bloodiest battles of the revolution. The fighting was so fierce that Cornwallis exclaimed, I never saw such fighting since God made me. The Americans fought like demons. The British general suffered a devastating loss of one fourth of his troops, prompting British Parliament member Charles Fox to exclaim, Another such victory would ruin the British army. With his army severely decimated at Guilford, Cornwallis retreated toward Wilmington on the North Carolina coast where he made a suicidal decision. He marched into Virginia and became trapped at Yorktown 
where he surrendered his entire force to a combined French and American army. And although the retreat by General Nathaniel Green had received little recognition for what it accomplished, after Cornwallis' surrender, a Maryland Continental soldier said, credit is unquestionably due to the army before Yorktown for their gallantry in compelling Cornwallis to surrender. But I hope it'll never be forgotten that the army of Green took off the keen edge of the sword of the enemy and made him a far easier conquest than he otherwise would have been. <laughs>